is manosphere this is a question that uh, people on the internet are asking more and more these days not so much in india but uh, maybe in the west a little bit more than india but even in india this is happening guys it's happening and i will tell you what is happening because i have an expert for you all the way across from united kingdoms uh, to answer this question what is manosphere uh, hello annie kelly hi thank you so much for having me and uh, annie by all means is an expert in manosphere because she has literally done a phd on this and uh, just to give you a little bit of introduction uh, of what annie does uh, she is a host of a new podcast called man clan it's on the qanon anonymous podcast feed you can check it out it's a very fun podcast which explores conspiracy theories of uh, varying nature and uh, annie is the uk correspondent for them and she has done a uh, research on anti feminism conspiracy theories in the west and the far right uh, annie do you want to add anything else to your uh, introduction um no i think you got it all ah that's amazing and uh, for our union leader of spectators today is my colleague nivedita prakasham she is a stand up comedian uh, she is a creator at ivm and of course my colleague as i already told you and uh, yeah so that is what uh, we are going to do today and it is going to be a very tricky thing to handle any and please help me please interrupt wherever i say nonsensical things or even nivedita says nonsensical things <laughs> but uh, just to start uh, i think uh, let's start with nivedita i want to know if she knows what manosphere is uh, do you know nivedita i mean out of context from everything that you said i feel like <laughs> Uh, it must be an environment that men have made that is uncomfortable for women to be in <laughs> how how close am i it's a man's world and uh, we're trying to make our space in it type of thing any uh, do you want to answer that question what is manosphere yeah i mean that's that's pretty spot on the manosphere is a term it feels like it's fallen a little bit out of fashion now um but it was very very big for a while which was essentially a series of blogs of forums and uh influencers who wanted to focus on questions surrounding masculinity men's rights uh anti-feminism and i suppose a kind of strange mixture of self-help and uh masculine politics is okay yeah probably the best summary um but it was all it was called the sphere essentially because yeah. it was it's so internet based it was um yeah a kind of a, a sphere of a sphere of this kind of various sort of politics and self help and community surrounding the question of manliness and masculinity um so uh, can you tell me what your phd topic was the thesis if i may ask yeah so um the original idea for my phd thesis um i think if you speak to a lot of academics on this you'll maybe find that it often starts in one place and ends up in another course, and my phd yeah. was no different so the yeah. original idea for my phd was to study um these spaces i think i picked three different sites as my basis of study um over a four year period okay and one thing that i found actually was they changed really rapidly over that four year period and many of them which had been mainly focused on um men's politics and men's rights moved to a more i guess white nationalist and white supremacist ideology over that time um so i say i study kind of anti-feminism and the far right I had originally intended just to study anti-feminism but the way that these sites evolved over the time that we were studying uh meant that I had to look at far right and white nationalist politics too. Interesting. Uh Nivedita uh do you see any uh parallels between what Annie is saying and India? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> In fact, I think I know exactly what she's talking about. I think there was something called the red pill 
Um, mm. Is yes. that part of the yeah manosphere? Yeah, I know about that, and that's a huge thing here in India also, where like men feel like they're being targeted every time feminism comes up. Feminism is almost so, a man hating. Uh, it's synonymous to man hating over here, and ev- anything. It, it's. I mean, I'm a stand-up comedian. You know how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can't say anything without a man getting angry. It's almost like men don't have a sense of humor at all. <laughs> like, yeah. It's all. We. You can't say anything without a man getting angry. Uh, female comedians here in India are extremely hated. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, it was something I remember when I was studying it. My. <clears throat> I specifically chose sites that were all based in the United States, just because it made it easier. Um, to study uh, uh, anti-feminist culture when they're all coming from the same culture. But one mm-hmm. thing that experts and lots of stuff I read um, all over the all over the world would say about anti-feminist, the anti-feminist internet, they say the United States is the biggest one and India is the second biggest one. So I never actually researched oh. India, but I was always aware that that was, um, yeah, a huge sphere of influence there too. Uh, Annie, I have some fun things to tell you about India today. But, That's uh, exciting. I, yes, I'm going to tell you about a uh, lot of things that are happening here, which I have also found out over the uh, last uh, few months. Actually, what got me interested in looking into what is happening in India was also your podcast, which is QAnon Anonymous, right? Um, I was looking for parallels between QAnon and, you know, what is the sort of conspiracy sphere here in India. Mm. And it's bizarre that, I mean, you can also tell me this a little more, um, the the sort of intersection between conspiracy theories and the uh, anti-feminism and toxic masculinity, particularly. Why does that happen? And because it's happening here as well. So I'm just asking that. Yeah, so I think... I think often conspiracy theories are the way that human minds solve a problem or solve two seemingly incompatible pieces of information. And and that doesn't necessarily mean that like those pieces of information are correct, Um, but if they both exist in a person's worldview but don't seem to fit, often what people will do is they'll make a conspiracy theory in order to make those two things join together. So in the Manosphere example, you know, not every single anti-feminist is a conspiracy theorist necessarily, but a quite common conspiracy theory that will come up is the idea that women have had some kind of malign outside force helping them to gain domination over men. And Mm. the reason they have to have this conspiracy theory a lot of the time is because there's two pieces of information that don't fit. There's the one that says men should be naturally dominant over women uh, and women should be naturally passive and submissive. But then there's also the piece of information where they say they live in a world where women dominate over men. So it's topsy-turvy, something's gone wrong. And often the way that people often the way that people in these spaces will try and make those two pieces of information fit together is they'll say, well, you know, somebody helped the women get gain this, mm. uh, this upper hand over us because they would never naturally get it. Naturally, they would be happy with their roles as wives and homemakers and all the rest of it. Um, so feminism has to have been, you know, and some will say it was, you know, the USSR and the communists over there that invented feminism. And in the more kind of neo-Nazi spaces, they'll say it's the Jews that did this, that created feminism to destroy the fabric of our society. Right. Um, so it can be it can be different people who are responsible for this. But I think this is often how conspiracy theories manifest. And this isn't just, I think, for uh, anti-feminists or the manosphere, but that's the one that I was studying, essentially. Fascinating. Uh, you know, uh, Nivedita, I was, I wanted to ask you, like, you must have had much, many encounters with uh, toxic masculinity. Yeah, uh, we live in India, I mean, I mean of course, obviously. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, we do, we do. I, I agree, we do live in India. So uh, can you talk about that a little bit, uh, maybe just like your experiences and wh- how you see ta- toxic masculinity? I mean, I think um, it's uh, different for different people in 
in urban areas, masculinity and toxic masculinity is completely different from what it's like in the villages or smaller towns. It's it's um, hard to pinpoint exactly how it affects you as a person. In general, I think women are all affected by it in the same way, but in different capacities. So when you come from a village or from a small town where I come from, one of the things I always talk about is how in India, in Bombay or in Delhi, you can date, you can go out with a person uh, alone and no one will judge you. But you can't do that in a small town in India. That's impossible because immediately once you're seen with a man alone, your character is immediately taken into consideration. And now everybody around you, even people your own age, I'm not talking about the elders. I'm also talking about your friends start judging you and your character. And that can get you into a lot of trouble as a woman. Like they can force you into a marriage. They can mm. uh, stop your education. The consequences are so large when you're from a small town, but in an urban area, it's so different, isn't it? Like you can go out, your parents have probably dated at some point. Mm. Um, so the patriarchy has levels uh, depending on where you come from. And so I have seen it in different levels. It happens in the family where like if you grew up in a family that doesn't allow you to go out, that's a different a thing altogether. You're not allowed mm. to go. Uh, say, I remember one of uh, my friends wasn't allowed to go to dance classes because their parents were like, oh, you know, there are going to be boys there. How can you go learn the skill? where there are going to be boys. And you're always, the girl is always blamed for whatever happens. If a boy likes you, it's your fault. If if you're in a relationship, it's a girl's fault. It's always the girl's fault. So it's so, it's so much bigger in smaller towns than it is outside. So I think the level hmm. is different, but that's why you have to tackle it differently in different spaces because it's impossible to bring what we find in urban areas as feminism to a smaller town you have to start from the basics and tell people like you you have to start from the bottom it's so hard yeah. to do it's so hard to yeah. do when you know that there's a world out there where it's completely free i think that's why all the smaller town girls from tamil nadu all like try to leave because there's yeah. they know there's no way for them to get the life they can see is possible in their own towns or states. The freedoms that are available in urban spaces, of course, there are levels to that as well. Yes. Uh, you know, the interesting thing, so I, I can compare Coimbatore to where I come from, which is Nagpur, right? This this yeah. place in central India, uh, Annie. Uh, so I left uh, Nagpur, I think, like some 12 years ago, and I came to Delhi. And, you know, the interesting thing is, you know, what book I was reading back then, Neil Strauss's The Game, right? <laughs> and I was I was a very desperate child back then. Uh, I was uh, very not doing well at all in anything that I was doing. So I was in that space, which is like a semi-introducing pre-incel phase mm. where, uh, you know, like I was just like, oh, this is a game. I have to win women and I have mm. to do these things. And of course, the book also taught me that. And the weird thing that happened to me is that I tried to uh, sort of date in Delhi, date being, you know, in quotes. I met these extremely feminist uh, women from Kolkata. Now, Kolkata has these universities, which is Jadavpur and all these places, which are very uh, heavy and very strong feminist spaces. Uh, now, they schooled me so badly <laughs> for years <laughs> that it changed my complete perspective of uh, essentially how I look at women, right? Um, just to take it a little from there, I feel like in India, you will find many of these examples. And now those people are also online. Back then, maybe we were not that online. Um, do you see that as something that you can relate to, Annie, with, with your research or what you have seen? Um, I mean, well, I can definitely relate to reading the game at a young age. I also read the game when I was probably about 13. <laughs> um, it's obviously a very different experience, I think, reading yes. that book as a woman. Having said that, you know, um, I do sometimes think that if you are, you know, I guess a shy or sensitive or kind of introverted young person, you know, some of the pickup artist advice, I think, was actually just like quite good advice, you know, just stuff mm. about getting yourself out there, about not taking rejection really personally, about, you know, being not being afraid to kind of strike out with people. I actually think that was really helpful advice for me, even as like, 
not the target audience a 13 year old girl to read do you know um it's a shame i think that some of these really kind of quite basic social skills um that are probably quite helpful for young people um about kind of you know faking confidence fake it till you make it with confidence yeah not being yeah not being afraid of other people about you know um, putting yourself out there it's a shame that so much of that i think gets tied up with this increasingly bitter or resentful understanding of women and Mm. um almost like a lack of empathy i think for you know for women um and you know i often when i say this to people you know that i i found some of the kind of early pickup artist um advice that it's very most basic helpful people are really surprised by that I think because I am people... surprised. I w- I was shook. Yeah. I was like, "What?" <laughs> I mean, you know, I was thirteen years old. I wasn't like trying to pick people up at bars, but I was trying to sure. make friends. Do you know? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I I often think that's because we still live in this understanding, which isn't. I think. Uh, I wish it was only the manosphere that thought this way, but actually, it's a hell of a lot of the wider world, which mm. that we still think of as like men and women as different species do you Mm. know when of course we do have our differences because we have different life experiences different freedoms different permissions um but i think humans generally do respond positively to some very similar traits which are confidence Mm. openness you know um people who make you feel comfortable who don't make you feel afraid you know uh, i think that's just generally quite yeah, I think people of, of every gender like that. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. And so I yeah. guess I sometimes wish that, I guess I sometimes wish that this advice was being packaged in a different way. Um, mm. That it was, yeah, it was mm. kind of less sort of specific to, you know, you're a man and you have to be this way and all women are this way. Um, yeah. Uh, but that stuff... You know, I mean, I think, you know, there are plenty of like self-help books and stuff like that out there, but it doesn't seem to have this kind of cachet, this kind of um, exciting kind of branding to it, which I guess is what the Manosphere stuff does. It feels yeah. kind of very sort of edgy and cool. Uh, uh, precisely. Uh, Niv, are you familiar with uh, Neil Strauss's The Game? I am uh, not, but I understand what it is from what you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, the, the term peacocking, you book. must have heard. Yeah, I mean, it's a self-help book, again, in quotes. But uh, Jordan Peterson, before Jordan Peterson type. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically that. It's like the fountainhead of a lot of things that we will talk about. Got it, yeah. Um, have you heard of the term uh, peacocking? No. Uh, uh, so peacocking is when a man tries to go into a crowded space and wears like a hat or something to get attention. And oh. then women around him are supposed to look at that man and the man is supposed to feel special or like, this is a special man we are looking at. That's peacocking. Then you've heard of the term, term negging? Yes. Yeah. So all of these terms come from that book. Oh. Uh, and, and yeah, so it's, it's a, again, as I said, a fountainhead of a lot of things we will talk yeah. about. Um, and uh, so... Can you also uh, tell us, Annie, how you would define, say, toxic masculinity in general? Uh, What does that mean exactly? Yeah, you know, toxic masculinity is actually a term I I don't use that often. Okay. um, Mainly because I find the definition a little bit unclear. Sometimes when people say toxic masculinity, it sounds like they mean a kind of which I think is a real thing, a kind of masculinity which is harmful to the man who who has it, you know. So, for instance, he may not be able to, you know, he doesn't go to the doctor because he, you know, doesn't want to admit weakness. He doesn't cry. He doesn't show his emotions. All of these things that we know are actually kind of quite healthy expressions. And if you bottle them up, you can end up hurting yourself. But then sometimes it feels like people use toxic masculinity to mean something that's toxic to other people around them you know Mm. so the guy's got a lot of like a machismo he's you know uh he's kind of uh abusive to women he's you know uh makes women feel afraid he threatens 
uh, other men who he perceives as like uh, weaker than him. It, it feels like it's like a lot of concepts trying to fit yeah. into one one term. Um, and so, you is, is this is this like the alpha male sort of theory that we are talking about uh, here? Yeah. So I guess you know I think um, I I think it can be a little bit unclear. So I try to distinguish I guess between right. those two hmm. I guess those two um problems in, right. in masculinity uh being a danger to yourself and being a danger to others um they seem like two separate hmm. you know problems oh so does right. that mean toxic masculinity has nothing to do with um uh your masculinity being questioned and you lashing out from that like Mm. you're right that's what a lot of people think toxic mas- masculinity is mm. that you know men have such a big ego when it gets threatened they immediately lash out at the person who's threatening it mm. uh so you don't think that comes under the same category well i no i i think it does but i guess what i what i struggle with is it feels like there's so many people will use the term to mean all of these different things which i think okay. are real are real problems do you know hmm. um they're real problems that some men have one of them some men have all of them some men have mm-hmm. none of them do you know uh, yeah. so i guess i uh tend not to use the phrase because i i find it a little bit unclear as to which one you're talking about i think they're all right different issues like like uh, masculinity is a spectrum so yeah, <laughs> something yeah, like that exactly. yeah <laughs> um and and Uh, then there is another term that i wanted you to sort of unpack a little bit is hyper masculinity uh, mm. again one all of these terms are just dropped on you from out of nowhere <laughs> right so yeah. i'm just trying to make sense of them also if you can help us a little bit here yeah so i think um hyper masculinity is um i think the problem that you're identifying where um the problem almost is with <clears throat> i guess what we would call like the societal ideal of masculinity um mm. is that it kind of doesn't really represent a real person right it's <clears throat> a guy who is so strong who is so stoic you know that he he never kind of feels weakness he never shows pain um and actually that's just not really that's a superhuman right that's superman but it's not right. like an actual person yeah it's so not. i guess so i guess hyper masculinity is the kind of striving for this ideal uh this yeah I- ideal kind of understanding of masculinity um which yeah is i, I a if i had to work. say I, I, if I had to mention a meme here, it's that Chad meme which we have, which yeah, is like that yeah. strong-jawed, <laughs> very masculine-looking man, which yeah. seems so unreal. Yeah, yeah, he looks so unreal in the photographs, right? Like, yeah, and I, you know, I, I'm sure it's based on a, a, a real, incredibly handsome model, but like, I'm sure they're also <laughs> doctored. Do you know, like, yeah, people people don't naturally look like that. So it's one of those things where, yeah, I guess hypermasculinity is the constant striving. to be this slightly unreal um character it's like the male mm. barbie yeah exactly <laughs> ken doll <laughs> ken doll but the ken doll didn't have a lot of power it didn't have any influence either mm. like, i don't think the ken doll had any like no boy was like looked at the ken doll and went i want to be like this yeah <laughs> that's this true. man ken, who supports ken was barbie. not very <laughs> yeah it's not ken, famous yeah not popular, ken not was not a chad basically yeah <laughs> yeah uh, fascinating but i mean ken i i don't even remember what ken looks like right now because i was so focused on barbies i guess uh <laughs> interesting but uh, yeah I, i mean i knew uh, ken because of that song i'm a barbie girl if you remember oh, yeah. that yep. weird song yeah so i knew there was something called ken that was there but i've never seen one to be honest oh. at least uh, they used to sell like ken I... dolls with the barbie in a house because they had mm. a family and stuff but barbie was the oh. one with the jobs for some reason <laughs> she was she's oh. the one <laughs> yeah that's that's great <laughs> yeah. yeah so it's so the ultimate is female it... fantasy <laughs> <laughs> So is it safe to say that Ken was a beta male rather than a <laughs> alpha male uh, because he was letting the woman work? 
Well, yeah, I, I guess so. I'd never thought about yeah. him in those terms. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, Niv, you have you have something else to say, right? I mean, I thought you had something to say. No, no, no. I was just I, if I had, I forgotten. So <laughs> yeah, no, because you were like going, uh, uh, and then like you stopped. So I was like, okay, no, no, uh, no it's cool. So, another term uh, sorry annie i'm throwing a lot of terms at you because i think these are important terms is hypergamy 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 oh, yeah. i don't know how to... yeah uh, so from what i read uh, this is what it is uh, it says the action of marrying or forming a sexual relationship with a person of a superior sociological and educational background so the the theory as far as it goes uh, is that uh, women always go for like the top 1% male who has like some features which are you know genetically acceptable and they're like purebred horses essentially <laughs> uh, so so uh, hypergamy is about how the all the other males lose out on uh, companionship because of that mm -hmm. uh, companionship being a very broad term but mostly sex so um, it, is that a correct way to put it yeah so hypergamy i mean yeah it has a real sociological um meaning which is yeah just what you described kind of um yeah usually marrying like a above your class um but it sort of got like a new meaning in the manosphere and i guess this comes back to what we were talking about how you know there's some good advice in there but it's often seeded in with this very kind of reductionist, uh, very black and white ideology. And one of the terms that became, or well, the concepts that became very popular in the manosphere was that women were essentially incapable of true love in the fairy, fairy tale sense, um, oh. because they were always looking for someone better. So the idea was that, you know, you had to be, this hyper masculine, most alpha male you could be, because if you weren't, then your your wife, your girlfriend would leave you for someone she thought was better. And obviously, okay. this is yeah. So obviously, this is you know, this so this was called hypergamy, and it was it was you know decided among the the scholars of the manosphere that this this is how every female relationship works how all women's brain works and it's just a a natural inborn instinct that women have and it's obviously very you know dehumanizing uh to women um but it also i think you know breeds a kind of very i also think it makes its users who believe in it like deeply unhappy right because mm. it's a very insecure situation to be in the whole point of a relationship a loving relationship is that it should make you feel safe. It should make you feel yeah. comfortable. But essentially what these sites were teaching their male users was that even if you've got a girlfriend and you love her very much, you should never feel safe and you should never feel comfortable because any second now she could see, you know, a man with a bigger bank balance or better muscles and would just immediately up and leave you for him. And obviously, you know, life happens. Sometimes things like that do happen. But the way yeah. that it was kind of taught as something that you should expect and, you know, essentially never trust your female partner um, and never feel truly safe and secure, I think is actually quite a, quite a damaging concept to, to teach people. But it was incredibly popular. I don't know, I'm speaking in the past tense. It still remains incredibly popular in these spaces. No, I can relate to a lot of things that I'm thinking about which happened in India. But I have to take a break before we go to that. In the next part of this podcast, we will talk about Manosphere in India. I have a few examples and I want to see what uh, Anis has to say about that. And I want to see what uh, Niv thinks about it also. And now it's time for a break. Hey, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. This week, we have an episode of Cyrus Says with a live audience. The episode was shot at the IFP 2022 festival with Akash Banerjee, aka the Desh Bhakt. Cyrus, Akash and Meghnath gave some nuclear takes on the state of political satire in India. On Think Fast, Varun and Suchita picked topics ranging from YouTube hitting 8 million subscribers, the launch of business tycoon Ashneer Grover's book and more. On Shunya 1, Sheila Ditya is accompanied by Ravi Bhushan, 
founder and CEO of Bright Champs. They talk about development in the edtech sector. On postcards from nowhere, Utsav takes us back to 18th century America and France to discover the story of the evolution of modern paper. And on Nan Kari, Sadaf and Arshit are joined by Roshan Kariyappa, Vice President of the Marketing at Vimo. They talk about the concept of 10-minute food delivery. Once again, don't forget to visit our merch store on ivmpodcast.com. We have some exciting stuff for you over there. Follow us on social media. We are IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. If you like our shows, spread the word, tell your friends and don't forget to rate and review them wherever you're listening. You'll also find our shows on YouTube at youtube.com slash IVM Podcasts. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors this week. Bumble, Heads Up for Tales, Kotak Privy League Program and HDFC Mutual Fund. Thank you for making this possible. Hello and welcome to Explain Like I'm 10. Today we are asking the very important question, what is Manosphere? Uh, we have with us Annie Kelly to tell us what is a Manosphere and many other things. And our union leader of spectators today is Devedita Prakasam. But before we continue with this topic, I have a small announcement to make. On the feed right now, you will see a new show has magically appeared, which is called Page 10. Uh, you have been asking me, uh, why don't you talk about current affairs anymore? Why aren't you covering politics anymore? So to satiate that hunger of my audiences, I, we have launched a new show called Page 10. But it's a very no-nonsense one hour where you get four stories of the week from the past week. And uh, it is hosted by Abbas Momin. Please go check it out. It's audio only right now. So it is on our audio feed and you will also see it on our YouTube feed. Uh, probably it should be up right now. Or if Nikhil messed up, I can't help it. So yeah, let us continue with the topic. Um, before we went to break, guys, uh, I was I, I wanted to tell you a bit about what is happening in India in the manosphere space. Uh, Nivedita, can you think of any examples that you have uh, just off the top of your head? I mean, I would think Twitter is a really great place for this to thrive because I yeah. think the most amount of bullying happens on there. Like, especially yeah. if a woman has anything, is opinionated or has something to say, uh, immediately there's a, a few um, Twitter pages that will take that and just, that's just the theme of their Twitter page, just bullying mm. and picking out only women in fact every time there's a woman who puts out any any amount of stand-up when a woman mm. puts out a stand-up video there's immediately a bunch of people this is all over the world by the way i wouldn't say this is just india but in india there's just much more people i guess yeah. so it just happens way more than it happens anywhere else but it's extremely rude and i wouldn't say rude it's it's dangerous because yeah. we don't know if these things are going to happen in real life. Like, um, you don't know if these people are going to take this anger and come to a show, uh, you know, that's live. But I'd say the manosphere is mostly on Twitter and Reddit in India. Reddit, uh, yeah. That's where they take your pictures and post your picture on there or like um, they take your videos or bits from your videos and post that on there. And there's just this discussion of how horrible you are or how unfunny or how just just things about you not being a good woman <laughs> mm, yeah good woman. <laughs> that's true and in the comedy space it's very bizarre i think uruj speaks about it so uruj ashfaq is this comedian uh, annie uh, who speaks about this about how every time she comes on stage everybody just expects her to make jokes about boobs and sex you know mm. like it's just this this entire crowd which just wants her to talk about that but she doesn't want to talk about that she wants to talk about other things but she says that whenever she talks about other things they're not interested so no that's actually, <laughs> that's actually not entirely true even yeah. the the thing is that they expect us to talk about that in fact when we don't talk about that, we almost get praised for it. Like, oh, this is one female oh. comedian that mm. hasn't spoken about boobs and bras. I, I, my mind is blown. She's actually funny. She actually can be clean. It's almost as if whenever, especially an Indian comedian speaks anything 
on sexual terms, she immediately gets branded and she's the one who gets the most amount of hate. So even as a woman who does not touch on those topics and starts doing clean comedy, you feel almost guilty about it because people compliment you on it. But you don't like to take that compliment because when you take that compliment, you feel like you're attacking every other woman in the scene for something that's not even their fault. Uh, I, I would like to add that there are several women who talk about their sexual experiences and all of that and all of them get way too much hate more than it is deserved and it's almost because i think in india we have a very um conservative culture and almost mm. as if they do not expect or allow women to talk about sex so when we do it on stage especially female comedians who are much braver and much more open about their experiences it's almost seen as taboo and we're branded that way it's it's almost as if they think every female comedian is dirty or somehow unclean for what they talk about. And uh, so even with Uruj and stuff, she will purposely bring in a set about periods because she wants to, she wants to break that. She wants to break that balance. Like if someone compliments her about being clean, I'm sure the next thing a clean comedian, especially if you're female, next thing you're going to do is bring bras or boobs into your, into your <laughs> yeah. The way we rebel. We don't want these people to like any of us. Like if you're going <laughs> to hate us, hate us all. <laughs> Equally. Um, yeah, because it's not being nice. Yeah. It's, I guess it's not nice to, um, to be praised in a way that it's just denigrating other women, right? Like, you know, mm. oh, you're not like all of those other women, you know, that's like, yeah. that's yeah. not really nice to hear because it's kind of saying, you know, oh, I don't really like anybody of your gender that much, but you're okay. Do you know, which is, yeah. I don't think anyone likes to hear that. And that is a very weird uh, segue, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, there is a very <laughs> conservative movement happening in India, uh, which is called the Meninist movement, which has been going on for a while now. Uh, if you have encountered it, uh, Annie, as well. Uh, so we have this thing called Dowry. Uh, and uh, in the uh, it was banned in the 60s. And in the 80s, it became a stricter law. So there was this tiny movement that started, which said... Of, of these men getting together which said that this is an anti-man law which is essentially women will file uh, false cases against us uh, they will extort us uh, and then they will basically get the advantages of uh, you know the, the legal system right so there was this big uh, this movement that started and it actually became something bizarre uh, it is now extending to sexual violence uh, and even me too, right? You know, where uh, whenever a woman complains about a man making advances towards her or sexual advances or even workplace harassment, uh, there is this group of men which come up. Uh, they basically say that, oh, uh, women file false cases all the time. So even like legitimate victims are essentially targeted by them and called liars, essentially, right? Um, and that is actually the manosphere that, one part of the manosphere in India here where uh, uh, there's a legal backlash against it, if that makes sense. Um, is there anything of this sort happening uh, in the UK or the West as well? Yeah, there have been in almost every case where, um, you know, female equality or laws that protect women have been enshrined into law. Um, in the UK and the US, there has been a a backlash, and it's mm. it's looked quite similar. Um, in my own country, in the UK, uh, marital rape was only outlawed in the 1990s. Here, okay. um, before that, it was not. Yeah, it was um, the, it was a kind of loophole in the law, essentially, um, and. There was a huge backlash to that where people were saying much the same thing. They were saying, well, this just encourages false accusations. And now if a woman wants to get a bit more money in the divorce, she'll just say that she's been raped. Um, you know, this is sexist against men. Um, and, you know, I think in a way, quite often what these people are responding to they are kind of correct in a way that it is diminishing, you know, a, a kind of a, a sense of privilege, a sense of status. Um, 
but they're kind of almost looking at that in this kind of macro, this tiny, you mm. know, sort of um, lens and kind of not, I guess, understanding the bigger picture, which is saying like, yes, but women have only been like, you know, allowed to file for divorce, say, for this amount of time. And, um, you know, and a dowry has, in your in your country has only been illegal for 40 years. So it's actually trying to address this this huge long imbalance, essentially. Yeah. Um so they kind of, but they're kind of zeroing in on that loss of status, that loss of privilege, and you know, saying there's there's no similar loss of privilege for women. Therefore, this is a, a sexist law. Uh, Niv, so there was this one more uh, sort of instance. So, like, as as Annie said, marital rape was outlawed and outlawed, outlawed in UK. In India, it is still a thing. You know, like marital mm, still uh, rape for. is. We are still fighting for it. In fact, the court just gave a judgment saying that, oh, it, on these lines, which is the meninist line, if I may say so, uh, that uh, mm. there would be a, a chance of, uh, you know, false accusations and etc. Mm. Plus, there's this whole argument of destroying family values yes. that is attached to this, right? Um, and uh, it's it's bizarre when people make these arguments because I have this very fun organization I want to tell you guys about. It's called a Save Indian Family Foundation or SIF, which has essentially been leading this uh, movement, quote unquote, of sorts. Now, I want to read out one uh, very fascinating thing about uh, what they said on their uh, FAQs. What are SIF's views on feminists? Okay, uh, this is what they say, quote, most feminists are intellectually challenged individuals with very less academic grounding. They are basically frustrated, angry individuals who think intolerance and hate will improve conditions of women in the world. In reality, the condition of women improves due to technology, which mostly men created. Feminists are also extremely ungrateful people who will never get satisfied with any improvement in condition of women. What is this hatred against feminism? I want to answer. I want both of you to answer this if you can. Yeah, I mean, well, I suppose there is a, a, a hatred of feminists. I think in much the same way there is a kind of hatred of uh, lots of different kinds of activists, um, you know, civil rights activists. Um, you often see it a lot, I think, with climate activists as well in mm. my country as well, where I think people respond very badly to the idea that they should feel guilty about something um and so there's a kind of political disagreement but i think there's also a, a slight psychological disagreement there too um which is that if you are a man and in some cases a woman i will say you know it's not as if all of these people all of these uh, activists are men um yeah. you know, somebody saying that the situation is not good enough for this minority group uh, that the status quo harms this group, that the status quo harms the planet, can in many ways feel like an attack if you are benefiting from the status quo. Do you mm. know? Um, and so it feels, you know, as if you personally are being told that you were a bad person. Mm. Um, and of course, you know, the truth is, I think if you ask many of these activists, they would say, I don't really care if people feel bad or not. I just want the law to be changed. I just want the status quo to change. Do you know? Um, yeah. But it's not necessarily what people hear. People hear mm. you were a bad person. You were, you, you know, you were being privileged by this uh, terrible state of affairs. And so it doesn't just simply become you were wrong. It also becomes, you know, the stuff you were reading, you were intellectually challenged, you were yeah. ungrateful, you will never be satisfied, you know, uh, because in, in their, and in, I think in their minds, they are responding to a similar kind of attack on a person, on your personhood. Mm. And, and Niv, the example you were giving earlier of, uh, you know, uh, people in, say, small town India, women in small town India trying to escape uh, to more liberated spaces. Uh, I think the title of this organization actually speaks a lot, which is Save Indian Family Foundation, right? Mm -hmm. Which is this whole value of the 
family that is attached to the whole thing about how you need to be a unit how you have a certain role how women have a certain role in the household and they shouldn't sort of exceed that right um, do you want to sort of react to that part the yeah i think part? the reason um we have this whole family thing in india is because we have a culture uh, that surrounds or we, we're very pr- we're very proud of how we don't have any divorces like the divorce rate is really low here but nobody looks closer and sees that despite the divorce rate being low a lot of families did live apart if you go to villages mm. a lot of women don't they can't get a divorce because of the stigma around it but they will leave and go back to their parents house or live separately from their husbands there are broken families even in india it's just that the stigma around divorce didn't allow them to get a divorce but from the outside it seems like indians have a very strong family structure and so mm. because of this pride that we've made up and is not entirely true they they want to keep that as you know this flag bearer of oh look at how morally amazing we are because in india one of the things that we rest our entire confidence and self esteem on is our morals it's the one yeah. thing shame is the biggest problem for an indian like the one thing we can't stand is being shamed for something right so i feel like in in indian families the reason families stay together is because of the women who are conditioned to take care of everything whatever no matter what happens the reason mm. most of these families stay together is because of the amount of pressure and responsibility the women take and the reason the women take these undue like completely unwarranted responsibilities is because they have been trained for it their entire lives they have not seen anything other than what people have told them for example your mom or my mom i know that my mom's generation when they grew up they were brought up to get married and take care of the children yes. and take care of the mm. house take care of your husband and it's a very common thing among the women in their generation to say oh i serve my husband very well do you do it mm. well enough and there's a certain pride in being good to your husband and your family so that's where it's a they call it the family and the the you know the the morally amazing family but there's so much behind it that is so toxic in the sense that people don't the reason people aren't able to do anything bad is because they don't have the freedom to do it if people have freedom they will do bad things but here hmm. no one has the freedom to do it because the consequences of doing something wrong in india is so grave that you'd rather just stick to whatever uncomfortable situation you're in because then you just if you if you break the rule you die or people isolate you and you're like completely ostracized from the community it's it's horrible the alternate like um, yeah. situation you know i know someone uh, i i won't i won't of course reveal who it is uh, from from she's from an underprivileged background and uh, she uh, essentially recently she has been getting beaten by her husband for a while now uh you know and and she wasn't speaking up about it but recently the husband showed up at her workplace and got really abusive with her and he was drunk and whatever um so they had to call the police it went to that level right where uh, the police was called the man was arrested taken to the police station etc um now she uh, was very happy after that to be very honest she was like oh my god i'm i'm free i i, I can't deal with this guy anymore but her mother came and her uh, whole society basically told her that uh, you need to get him out and you can't file a complaint right and then uh, we were sort of trying to tell her ki no you need to file a complaint the the man deserves to get punished she went to the police station and the weirdest thing happens where and it's not that weird in india but um, the police also gave her the same advice which is essentially oh why are you filing a complaint this will go to the courts your family will break up think about your children right and this is a woman who had her first kid when she was 17 right and uh, it's it's bizarre how um, she was conditioned to and almost forced to not file that complaint and the man is out now and he continues to drink and continues to do whatever and we hear these sto- stories so many times in 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 india now this is i think a manifestation of a manosphere in non online spaces i would say mm-hmm. right 
um do you have uh, anything to say about that uh, any the real world consequences of something like the manosphere no i mean it's you know so heartbreaking hearing that story um yeah. and i think it's something that i guess anti feminists in in my own country and the united states they often um will be very nostalgic about the these countries more socially conservative past hmm, more kind hmm. of you know uh where people were more religious and uh the roles for women were more strict um and they'll sort of you know look back at i guess you know advertising from like the 1960s where it's you know happy wife happy husband children you know and they'll say you know this is we've all gone wrong since then this we well, you know look how mm. Look how you know peaceful and 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 delightful this kind of family scene is, and of course for some people it was delightful. Do you know it was just a happy family? And um, but I often think there's a there's a missing story when people nostalgize the past, nostalgize mm-hmm. kind of you know social conservative um, cultures where a lot of this the kind of violence, the abuse. Uh, the, I guess, levels of kind of misery, um, particularly on behalf of people from underprivileged backgrounds or um, poorer women who had, you know, no no chance of being able to yeah. to get out, um, is forgotten because it never made for a good, it never made for a heartwarming story, and it also was considered, you know, rude to talk about. It was considered, mm. you know, a uh, uh, not a particularly kind of happy happy subject um and so we often i think i think social conservatives often look back on the past with these rose tinted glasses because they forget how much um unhappiness was was swept under the rug in mm. kind of more socially conservative cultures and i think yeah the examples that you're giving speak to that absolutely what nivedita said i think i can relate to that because i know so many unhappy marriages around me mm. right now and, and like my mom and dad's generations who just don't get along they don't talk to each other but they are still staying together yeah. because uh, essentially they a, can't get a divorce because what will people around me say and you know ostracization happens to a large extent when you um, are divorced especially for the older generation maybe it's more common in urban places in my generation but not really in like my mom or dad's sort of uh, generation at all um interestingly enough any so uh, going towards q and on and this is the last bit that i want to go to uh, so you guys do a podcast on q and on right which is uh, uh, and i i'm i'm obsessed with that podcast i must say <laughs> again check it out uh, q and on anonymous uh, you guys go down these conspiracy rabbit holes very often i just yeah. want to ask you did you ever see any indian instances of conspiracy theories or uh, manosphere or anything of that sort any indian instances no that's a really interesting question i've definitely i think um because obviously there's a quite big uh, indian and pakistani diaspora in the uk yes um and so i've definitely seen um when i've been to rallies uh like anti vaccine rallies and qanon rallies i've often talked to a lot of people who um are either first generation or second generation who um particularly i think in the anti vaccine uh mm. rallies that i went to some of the really big ones there about god it was a few thousand people in in mm. london so it was really really big um and i think there were a lot of it was a very diverse crowd uh in a way that i guess for some of the other conspiracy theories i cover which tend to be more racist more racially racially exclusive you obviously aren't going to get as many yeah. people there um and i think you know i think there's some really interesting there's a really interesting history i think particularly with the british empire and the way that vaccines were used um historically that i think you know because funnily enough the the first um the the first kind of 
prototype of the vaccine inoculation was actually in India first before it was mm. in Europe. Um, and that was when people would, uh, before there was a kind of needle, people would um, use little bits of smallpox and uh, give it to children in order to give them a small kind of hopefully safe version of smallpox and it would prevent them from getting the full-blown disease later on. And this was something that uh, Edward Jenner, who then created the cowpox vaccine, he was building on this prototype. Mm. Um, but once he did that, Edward Jenner was British, the British Empire kind of suddenly, suddenly go back to all of their colonies and they say, we've got this brand new invention. It's, you know, a sign of, you know, British excellence. Yeah. Um, and you will have to use this instead of what you've been using for hundreds of years, which obviously <laughs> did, did, you know, <laughs> did not go down well. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, there's lots of different reasons that people would embrace anti-vaccine conspiracy theories. But I think at least one of them, for some of those people in that crowd, was they kind of understood vaccines in this history of, you know, imperialism and, and colonial arrogance, do you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think that was, yeah, I think that was um, one of the examples there offshoots. of the way that can, of offshoots, of the way that conspiracy yeah. theories will, I guess, draw on different histories depending on who is listening and, and producing them. Yeah. And depending on convenience, basically, if, if it fits exactly. their narrative, then they will pick up parts of history and build it up together. Uh, just to give you started on a rabbit hole, if you care to explore it, <laughs> uh, there is this uh, justice for SSR movement, uh, which has been happening in India for a while now. Uh, and it has gone to like very bizarre territories. Uh, when I was, uh, when it was first happening, it was the first year of the pandemic. Uh, our, our beloved actor Sushant Singh Rajput, uh, uh, I mean, he died. Unfortunately, he took his own life, and uh, there were these nutty people who came out of nowhere, and they started making conspiracies around the death. Right? You know mm -hmm. about how he was murdered, how how you know it was. Yeah. Our mainstream news channels, much like Fox News in the US, they picked up on this and they saw an opportunity to turn this into a spectacle. So then they got like a ton of people who were making the, making up their own things. And it went to bizarre levels, right? Um, one, SSR was defied as this person who had found a cure for the vac uh, for the pandemic and you know he was murdered because of that and then there was this th that someone did a black magic on someone and you know like it, it went to like these sort of territories the parallels that i found between qanon and uh, ssr were that suddenly out of nowhere mm. these group of people just sort of coalesced into this one movement it seemed manufactured to me earlier uh, that someone was doing this thing, but it isn't. It's still going on. And mm. it's organic. And and I think the manosphere also to a large extent looks like it's organic. Um, uh, can you talk about that a little bit, about the organic versus inorganic nature of these movements? Yeah. So I think, you know, something that the internet, the promise of the internet, you know, when it first started, was this idea that it would bring together people from you know different parts of the world all work together with a shared interest and that largely is true i mean look at the fact that you and i are all just sat together just discussing this one thing from others yeah. other sides of the world like that's yeah. kind of incredible do you know yeah it is uh, people couldn't have imagined that 30 40 years ago but i think we are still very much in the infancy of figuring out what that instant connectivity can do with people's brains, with people's imaginations. And I think one thing that we're learning that people really like to do together um, and like having a shared community to do together is unravel mysteries, to research together, to mm. hunt down clues, do you know? And yeah. In a way, you might say that that's what we're doing right now. You know, we're kind of having this conversation where you want to understand something. Um, and I also want to kind of understand what you have to teach me about the manosphere in India. So we're together, we're unraveling those mysteries. 
But I think it does also kind of lend itself a little bit to conspiracy theories, right? Because mm. if you think about what I said about conspiracy theories coming when there's two conflicting bits of information, sometimes the answer is just really boring. It's just that one of those bits of information you got about a famous actor's death just happened to be wrong. You know, they said it happened on this time, but actually it happened mm. this time. But people will seize on that and be like, yeah. ha ha. How did they know he was going to die an hour before he actually did? There must be a conspiracy. And mm. because that's more fun and it's exciting and people like that kind of mystery, that way it kind of gets everyone's brains going like, oh, yeah, what other little bits of inconsistencies can we find? You can essentially create a community that will then work together to create a story out of, yeah. out of nothing. Do you know? And I think you see this happen time and time again. Um, and I think it may just be something to do with how our brains work, what we find fun, what we find like exciting, what makes us tick. Yeah. And so I think that's the that's the organic side. Do you know that that to a certain degree this is just going to happen when people to get together and have a whole bunch of information flying at them? Hmm. But there is sometimes I think a manufactured uh element and which is you know yeah you, you can you can sound a little bit like a conspiracy theorist yourself when you say this yes, yes. <laughs> so you have to, to be see. careful <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um you know there is there are bad actors that have a really strong interest in pushing certain stories certain bits of information uh you know certain politicians for instance will really benefit from conspiracy theories um there are certain but you know if you want to run a really dirty campaign, there's nothing, you know, nothing better than just getting this kind of murky conspiracy going around all about your opponent, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, yeah. and politicians would be silly not to use that, you know, to a certain extent. That's the that's the tools that are at their disposal. Um, if it's only something like ethics that stands in the way, many of them will do it. So I think yeah. it is worth considering sometimes when you come across this exciting story that kind of really like flares up your passions that you're like oh man I'm so mad about this I can't believe this why isn't anyone covering this sometimes it's worth asking yourself and I have to do this to myself as well I'm not hmm. you know it's worth you know thinking like who benefits actually from a story like this who benefits from me getting this mad about it um just to like consider that I guess that's that's very interesting. In in this whole justice for SSR thing, the biggest, I would say, real world victim of this was this uh, actress called Rhea Chakraborty. Um, she was harassed constantly for, mm. I think, how much, if you remember, six months or more. It uh, was a long time. That. And it keeps it coming back. Time. I think it's still ongoing in the sense that every time she comes out in the open, it happens. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. it's 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 a very tragic story from her end also she just got caught in this middle of this giant conspiracy and then suddenly her life was over now nobody wants to touch her nobody wants to give her jobs nobody wants to uh, do anything with her essentially um there are some very real world consequences to essentially these conspiracy theories uh niv closing thoughts anything you wanted to i add? actually do have a question uh yeah. for you uh is there anything about women in the manosphere because <laughs> i have been consuming this content of right-wing americans and there's so many they've just pulled in so many well-read extremely intelligent and well-spoken women who like candace owens mm. uh who speaks very widely she, and she speaks very well almost i almost believe everything she's saying sometimes <laughs> when she's talking because she's very well read but it's so ironic that while she's such a powerful woman she's still saying things that benefit um a theory that will not allow her to be powerful for very long it's a very handmade stale story where i'm so confused uh, Niv, about... can you tell us i'm not aware of this can you tell us a little more about what she says oh it's uh the same thing that oh you know um she she's basically trying to say that what's feminine is women taking care of the house and taking care of the children and being able to cook and make a meal for your husband and the way feminists have now demonized that and made that unattractive or like that women should not do these things anymore which right. is not the point, but that's what 
the manosphere speaks of and that's what she mm. picks also that's what she uses in her argument and she goes although i'm a woman who's here outside you know i'm so morally great better than cardi b or any of those women <laughs> that are extremely sexually explicit but i'm not that i'm a much better person look at me uh i work i do a good job and i go home i make a meal for my husband i take care of my children i do it all without complaining and that's how women should actually be and she has this really big stage where a lot of people will listen to what she has to say because she is successful and now this is seen as a successful model but i mean if it if everything she's saying gets implemented then she doesn't have that stage anymore because then she'll just have to stay at home and take care of the children and her husband <laughs> will probably have to take her place so it's very confusing but there's so many women not just over there even over here in india there's so many yeah. women who are part of the manosphere what is the what is the psychology behind it <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many of them that I wouldn't want to like psychologically be like, oh, they're all like this or they're all like <laughs> that. But I think yeah. for a lot of them, they're just kind of, you know, it's actually just a really smart calculation from their point of view. Like if you think about how many young women who are saying like what you and I are saying, it's actually quite a lot of them. But mm-hmm. there's a there's a not so not so big a market for a young woman who's saying, actually yes women should be in the home we should never have got the right to vote you know <laughs> like this is yeah. this is it's hard to find a young woman who's who believes that so you know they it's they're exploiting essentially kind of an untapped market when they uh get up and and say these it's things. like their version of peacocking exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's all goes back to the game yeah. <laughs> um so it, it it kind of just you know makes sense that if you if you are a woman with i guess very conservative values um to ex- ex- exploit that and and make a as glittering a career as you can from it i should say i don't think kind of so into ever said that we shouldn't have the right to vote thing but there oh, are some women who do that. no there are some right. women who do but um no a lot of them are now yeah. very progressive in the sense yeah. that <laughs> they do understand <laughs> yeah. that they need the jobs <laughs> Yeah, they're very yeah. progressive Republicans, yeah, for sure. Um, but it's a hard field. Do you know it's a very hard field and I often see more commonly women who make a career out of it for a few years and actually just end up dropping out. Um mm. because the the harassment is so bad, do you know? In mm. many ways they're shielded from the worst of it. They're shielded from, you know, what their their fans would be saying to, you know, a a, a feminist. But also they, you know, when your recruitment strategy is resentment against women, then it's going to be not a brilliant field. It's going to be quite a tough field for women to make it in as well. And I've Absolutely. I've seen quite a few of I've seen quite a few of the rise and falls of these women's mm. careers now where they start off, you know, getting loads of kind of praise and attention and you know money and everyone's saying you know it's so it's so refreshing to hear a young woman say things like this someone who hasn't just fallen for the feminist that mind virus but <laughs> a few years later you actually see them kind of turning around and pleading with their audience they're like you know guys can you please stop harassing me about like oh, my boyfriends yeah. can you stop you know calling me all of these names like you know yes i know i'm not married and uh, in the home yet but i am only 23 can you can you give me a break oh, <laughs> like no. oh yeah. no <laughs> that's, that's horrible bad. so it's it's you know, like falling on your own sword uh, of, yeah. of sorts yeah uh, yeah so it's one of those things where it's it's in some ways it's it, it makes sense it's an, an easy field to get into because there's just not many of them mm. on the other hand it's a very very difficult field i think actually to stay in hmm. that that's scary in a way <laughs> where uh, i mean yeah i can imagine how that can not work mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, yeah. thank you so much any do you have any questions for us though if you have any particular ones um no uh, i just want to not say thank really. you so much for having me it's been so nice talking yes. to you both Yes. Thank you. Uh where can people find you Annie? Uh so you can find me uh uh on So you can find me speaking on QAnon Anonymous and our new yep. podcast series Man Clan where we look a little bit more about uh we look a little more into masculinity influences uh the manosphere 
and the history of, I guess, uh, masculine and anti-feminist influences in general. Um, that's QAnon Anonymous. We're on Twitter and yep. um, Patreon is where you can find our Man Clan series. And you can find me on Twitter as well. It's Annie K N K. I'm locked. But... Your uh, account is uh, uh, private, I think, locked. Yes, yeah. that's right. But if you request a follow, I'll, I'll just let you in. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> I just don't like. I don't like my tweets going viral anymore. I feel yeah. like when I was I... when I was younger, I used to really like that. I felt felt me made me feel really exciting, and you know, oh look at me, I'm a big name. But the older I get, the more I'm just like, oh, I don't have time for this. <laughs> <laughs> Completely makes sense. Uh, Nivedita, where can people find you? Anything to plug? Oh, no, just um, uh, watch Cyrus. <laughs> I don't know, where am I? Instagram, niv.prakasam, I guess. Yeah, that's the only. I'm not even active on there, but you can follow me. I like the numbers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can find me on at me Meghnad on Twitter till Twitter exists. I have a blue tick for another, I think, 40 days, I guess. Uh, so <laughs> please do follow me. You can find me with that. But 40 days later, I don't know whether you'll be able to find me or not. <laughs> uh, so yeah. And uh, you can find me on Mastodon also on at me Meghnad uh, and on Instagram at Meghnad uh, Guys, please listen to our new show, Page 10. Uh, I hope you like it. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you find it useful. Please give us feedback on what you think uh, should should happen on that show and this show. And if you have any more guests that you would like me to invite, uh, please do leave it in the comments below and subscribe. As all YouTubers say, like and subscribe because more audiences are required. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. See you next week.